Double check your uh, class schedule, Oglethorpe E, again, affordable care class. And we'll go ahead and, and jump on this thing. So Nathan in the general seminar mentioned that the House had passed the tax reform. Everybody hear that? Everybody aware of that, that the House passed the reform? Obviously going to the Senate. Senate will make some changes, but one interesting thing that I noticed is they attached affordable care to it. Did everybody see that? That, yeah. So they couldn't get it passed earlier, or they couldn't get rid of it earlier. So now they've attached it to the tax reform. So what do y'all think about that? Yeah, I I, I think a lot of people want to want to see the ACA go away or at least revise so that it's a it's a it's a little easier process. You know, in the class before we were talking, and there must be a thousand different situations that can go on, and of which. They don't have answers for all of those, either from a software standpoint and code, or you call the IRS, or you call the marketplace. So there's still a lot of moving pieces with, with this product. Um, I thought it was interesting, though, that they attached it to the, um, the, the tax bill. And somebody in an earlier class said, the reason why they did that, they don't want to pass the tax reform. They, 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 they really don't. They think by tagging this along with it, it just kills it. And then the Senate can say, hey, we tried. We, 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 we tried to pass reform, but you guys, it, it didn't get voted on. So anyway, like normal up there, and, and Jason lives in Virginia, not far from, from, from D.C. So uh, anyway, it sounds like it's, it's become a political football again. So unfortunately, unfortunately. So anyway, we'll keep up with it. You guys keep up with it. And obviously, as things change or, or, or go on, we'll implement them into the software if they either affect um, affordable care or anything like that. I know this is scheduled for next year. This wouldn't even really affect anything short term. But uh, again, um, you know, I just thought that was real interesting when I was reading over it this morning that they've, they've tagged that in with the tax stuff. So should be interesting to see what comes out of it. So how does the Affordable Care Act affect the tax return? Really, there's, there's three major areas, as most of you know. Uh, first, there's a penalty. That's for the people who, who don't have health care coverage. And I know your, your customers, when they come in, they love it when you calculate a penalty for them, don't they? You go, hey, do you have health care? And they go, no, 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 I don't. I don't. And the good news is most of them are used to it by now. If they haven't had health care in the past, they probably generated a penalty. But there's nothing worse than telling somebody they owe some money back because they don't have health care. Then all of a sudden, they start backing out of it, wanting to know how they can go back and get health care, or more importantly, how can you get rid of that penalty? So we've all, we've all experienced that. Second is any person who acquired their health care coverage through the marketplace or the, or the exchange to reconcile subsidy. And then lastly, it's added a couple of some taxes on. Uh, the first piece is the investment side of it, net, net investment tax. But the one we probably see more often is on the Schedule A. It's the itemized deductions with the medical care. Back when it was enacted, back in 11, remember it went from 7.5% to 10%. Remember that? So and it's amazing. You know, the, the, the people who did, and there weren't a lot of people who qualified for the medical exemption when I was doing taxes, but just, just that percentage change, it knocked quite a few people out of itemized deductions from the medical side. Not only that, now it's going into effect for 65 and over. Yep, yep, I agree. I agree. Well, they would give you something, but they take it away. Right away. They're, they're, they're good about that. They're good about that. So one of the changes in the software or one of the calculations, we'll calculate that automatically, though, for you. When you plug in the itemized deductions, we'll, we'll, if they're 65 or older, you don't have to worry about going in and saying, do I give this to them at 7.5 or 10 percent? We'll take care of all those calculations for you. So what is the Affordable Care Act? Hard to believe it was enacted back in 2010, isn't it? I know. Time flies when you're having fun, isn't that what they say? 
Yeah, it's hard to believe it's been a long, around that long, but yet there's still a lot of gaps, there's still a lot of questions, there's still, there's still a lot of pieces missing to this thing, I think, from, from, from all levels. It definitely needs some reform. I think there's some good pieces to it, but I think it also needs, needs a little bit more cleaning up if, you're gonna, if, if tax preparers are required to monitor, so to speak, this process. Um, everybody's heard it. It's Obamacare. In fact, I'll do it randomly. ACA, Affordable Care, Obama Act. And again, started back in 2011 and then is fully implemented up to this point in 2017. Somebody have a question? Did I hear? Okay. Sorry, must have been somebody out there. So, what was the purpose of ACA? A couple of things. Um, they wanted to expand health care coverage by one individual mandate for everybody and require at least a minimum essential amount of coverage. And again, all people throughout the entire country. This wasn't specific states, this wasn't specific regions, this was all across the country. The other thing, or the other purpose was, again, to create a federal subsidy for the health care premiums for certain people who did qualify. Minimum essential coverage. What is it? Well, it established minimum levels of benefits for the affordable care. So what were those benefits? Number one, no pre-existing conditions, maternity benefits, coverage of children until age 26, limitations on out-of-pocket maximums and deductibles, lifetime caps, also, the benefit plan or the policy has to pay a specified percentage of premium collected or employee contributions on claims. Now, policies that met minimal essential coverage are, and you should see this page, when you first go into our software, unless you're new with it, um, one of the first questions is, did they um, hit their minimal essential coverage. What, are, what is minimal essential coverages? What do those look like? Employer provided health care coverage, health insurance through the marketplace, Medicare, yep, your Medicaid's, uh, your CHIP program, and then uh, most of your veteran or active duty service members covered by some type of health care program. So the intended purpose of Affordable Care was again to expand health care coverage and they imposed what was called the individual mandate. That individual mandate, your customers love that, don't they? I hear that a lot. <laughs> so what is it? Everyone on the tax return has to have a minimum essential amount of coverage or guess what? They pay some money if they don't, right? So they have a shared responsibility payment. Who is that? That's everybody. The taxpayer, the spouse, and every dependent that you claim on the tax return. So everybody is part of this, this mandate. Now, one of the things mentioned in here is that they need health care coverage every month, every month. So a person is considered to have coverage in a month they had for any part of that month. That is a part of that. And I think they give you what, a two month gap? Is it two or I think it's two. Is it? Okay. I may have an error here then because I think on another slide it's a two month gap before. Okay. Thank y'all. I'm disappointed in my other classes. They didn't catch that. So um, Now, everyone on tax return has a minimum essential health care coverage or an exemption. So there's three types of exemptions out there for the health care. The first one, filing threshold exemptions. 
second, marketplace granted exemptions. And then the last, coverage exemptions. Sure. Sure. Well, actually, I'll jump on all, all three of them for you. So, perfect timing. So, filing threshold exemptions. Now, what is that? Taxpayers exempt from the requirement to have minimum essential health care coverage and is not subject to the shared responsibility payment if either their household income or their AGI is deemed below the following levels. So, for 2017, 2017, they've bumped up a little bit. Single, it's gone to 10,400, again up 50 bucks from 16. Head of household, 13.4, that's up from 13.35 in 2016. Married filing joint, 20,800, that's up 100 from 2016. Now married filing separately hasn't changed. They always get the short end of the stick, don't they? Married filing separately. Yep. They, they get a limited number of credits, don't they? Uh, qualifying widower with dependent child, 16,750. And that's up a little bit since 2016, 2016. And then if the taxpayer spouse is 65 or older, those filing threshold amounts are even higher than that. Yes, ma'am. Medicaid? Uh, money that, no, she's oh. Okay. All right, so the, the question is she's 20 years old, I'm assuming full time student? Full time student, yes. No other revenue? All she's getting is scholarship, and the question is, can that, whatever she doesn't spend for school scholarship, so let's say there's $1,000 left over, you're asking, can that $1,000 be applied as earned income or income so that she can qualify for? Okay. I'm not 100% positive, but I'm assuming no because it's not earned income, um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not positive. Does anybody know out here? We're going through the Affordable Care Act to, to, uh, to apply for the insurance. That leftover income, can she provide it to them so that she can still have coverage? So going through the marketplace, she goes in the marketplace, she's looking for insurance. Is it that she wants insurance? Does she want the subsidy? What is it that she's looking for? Because typically a student can get an insurance policy through school at a much, much, much cheaper rate than going through the marketplace. What's she trying to accomplish here? She wants health insurance, okay. I, I would think that, number one, I, I think there's a couple of things here. Number one, she may want to check through the school instead of going through the marketplace. And guys, y'all are prepares on this. In the marketplace, I would think she could still apply, but with very little income, she should probably get a pretty good... No, they would, they would... That's right, income level to even qualify. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. The, that's right. You're right. Well, is it state dependent though? I mean, state, don't each state have its own law? Well, no, there's a, there's a, a, a minimum, of well, each, each state does have an exchange that you can go through, and there's, there's different, sub, but the marketplace is, I think, standard across yeah, the board. It. So. I think it's $1,200 or something of income to qualify. I think it's 1200 A month or? No, that's a year. I mean, I said 1200 Yeah. Sorry, okay, no, it wouldn't be 12000 Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, 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 that's a good question. I'm not sure of. I guess the, 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 the real question is the leftover scholarship money, is that considered income? Mm -hmm. that's, that's number one. I guess number two, the, the money left over, would it, would it meet? Uh, how much income are we talking about? Do we know? Would it I'm even? Not even sure. Okay. Because if it doesn't even meet the minimum, then it, it's it's irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. Good question, though. Very good question. All right. 
So we got through the. Gotcha. Two and whatever that percentage is. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. All right. Yeah. So just a, sh a little bit short of three months then. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for looking that up. All right. Marketplace granted exemptions. What, what are these? Well, issued by the Federal Marketplace or State Exchange for reasons specified. Taxpayer must have applied for the exemption with the marketplace or the state exchange and met the conditions for the exemption. Also, each individual on the tax return is treated separately, and each person on the return must apply for a marketplace coverage exemption. Also, part of those granted exemptions, when approved by the federal marketplace or state exchange, they'll be issued a five, six, or seven digit certificate number, which is entered in the return. Now, what qualifies people for marketplace granted exemptions? The following reasons. Number one, members of an Indian tribe. Two, certain religious sects. Members of healthcare sharing ministries. General hardship. Incarceration. Um, the coverage is being deemed unaffordable. And then being ineligible for Medicaid in a state that, not, that did not expand that Medicaid coverage. Under coverage exemptions, claim for specific reasons when the taxpayer meets the eligibility requirements for claiming the exemptions. And those exemptions are not granted by the marketplace or by the state exchange. Instead, taxpayer claims these exemptions on the tax return. And again, they come in and see you guys. We plug the information in to determine if they're eligible for the exemption. I don't, I don't know a whole lot about it, but what, what's the question? And we got a resource here of about 40 people in a room. Well, they should have a certificate. Yeah, that well, I, with I the, got it from some of them, but okay. I, just, I had some of them that he said he lost his card stuff, so I'm wondering if I should just say, no, I can't do it because you bring me your card. Or, Unless I would have that certificate on file, and again, it's just me, but I think there's, you can go with them back into, um, the the, correct, the website, and then you should be able to access it and print it back out. Was it a question, or are you going to help her out with it? I would. Does it depend for Medicaid? Is there a low income, for example, they send their income until they call marketplace and they're not eligible to purchase insurance because the income's uh, too low and they refer them to their to Medi to go apply for Medicaid. Right. And then they go to Medicaid and then tell them, you know, based on the income, you don't qualify for Medicaid, so that, that makes them exempt. So yeah, there. I mean, again, if they're ineligible for Medicaid in that state, obviously. Um, but the, is there like a, a page to check the? Income requirements. I'll, 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 we should be with that Department of um, Human Services in, in the state of Texas that are different per state. Yeah. Okay. So it is. It's a chart out there when they go and apply for services, human services, and it, it is a chart. So 30, 32 states did expand it, 19 did not. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas is one of the states that right. did not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't expand it. They didn't expand in Mississippi either. So. so through human services, though, they should be able it's to get yeah. the, the exemption, the and then you plug that in. Yeah. Okay. Correct. But as long as they get the code from from uh, the marketplace, right. it's out of our hands. There's nothing else we need to do for them. Yeah, but well, there's some lazy people. They want us to. <laughs> well, I mean, you go. They want the you to go on the marketplace I mean, to find it. Yeah. You go through the marketplace and just get 
When I stopped doing taxes, my, t my customers must have gone to see you. It's a, they wanted me to do everything. <laughs> All right. All right, so coverage exemption. What can the taxpayers claim on that for the following reasons? Short coverage gap. And that's where the taxpayer went without coverage for no more than two consecutive months during the year. So there's the short coverage gap. Again, we mentioned Indian tribes. You know, if the taxpayer was either a member of a recognized Indian tribe, including uh, Alaska Natives, incarceration, so they're in jail or prison, uh, members of the health care sharing ministry, and uh, again, citizens living abroad, and then coverage is considered unaffordable. Okay, but if the taxpayer, uh, if the person was in jail or prison, you can't do Right. That, that, that's correct. Uh, they also, I think it was based on if they were claiming themselves and they were incarcerated during that period. So they wouldn't get penalized for not having health care during that time frame. So you so. could claim somebody that's your kid if they weren't in there the whole year, you know, six months. You know, six. Correct, as the, as, as the dependent. So let's, let's go back to your question. You're saying a child is in jail? Okay. Yeah, I mean, if it's the entire year, absolutely. It's not even claimed on the tax return. We're talking, and, and so what, what she was just saying is, hey, he was in for, let's say, over the two-month period or whatever. You do claim him as the dependent. You're exempt during that time frame that he was incarcerated. Okay, good question. All right, the shared responsibility payment. What is it? The responsibility payment is a fee or tax for not having health care coverage on an exemption. Now there's two ways that you can calculate this. First, it's a percentage of the household income. And then second, an assessment for each person who lacks the coverage. Obviously, in true IRS form, form the taxpayer always pays whichever's higher, right? I learned a, a while back when I, I tried to take the EA test and I learned real quickly that whatever question hurts the taxpayer the most, that's usually the correct answer. And it was amazing. I answered a lot more questions than I even knew the answers to just with that philosophy. So, hey, with that being said, I didn't pass the EA test, so I'm not, I'm not telling you to do that on everything. but. It, it, it worked with quite a few of the questions. So anyway, um, no, the IRS is good about, hey, we're going to give you two options, but the one that, that you pay the most taxes on is the one we're going to require from you. Yes, ma'am. Um, if a uh, parent, the children are on that pay, correct, but the parent income, uh, say like you made about like $20,000, and to apply for the Affordable Care Act, the insurance would, uh, would be too much for her. It costs too much. Okay. Could she then obtain an exempt number from the Affordable Care Act? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, they're parameters. I'm not sure what those are, but yes, if, it is, if it's truly too expensive based on, and it qualifies as unaffordable care, then, then yes, that would be an exemption. So you have to have that exemption number in order to um, not list the person. Correct. That is correct. Because I know sometimes the system itself will exempt a household based on that threshold. Based on income. That's correct. Or correct. Based on the, the household income. So did, did we answer your question? Okay. All right. It no, if it's below, right. you, you don't. Right. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. So, percentage of household income. 
2.5% of the household income. That's up, it's same as last year. That hasn't changed, but, but up from 2015. Maximum total yearly premium for na national average bronze. So the bronze plan, that's the index that they work off of. For one person, it's 2,676. For two people, it's 5,352. Three people, 8,028. Four people, 10,704. Five or more, it caps out at the 13,380. Now, per person on the return, 695 per each adult. Look at the difference in that since 2015. That's jumped up a bunch, isn't it? And think about all the way back to 211, back to 2011, how small it was. So they eased people into this, but last year and this year, you're getting hit pretty hard. 695 per adult. Look at the dependents. 162, and again, same numbers as last year, but from compared to 15, it's jumped up tremendously. Yeah. You know, it, it, I guess one of the sad things in one of the previous classes, one of the, the, the people in here said, you know what, though? I've got people coming in with the, the, the maximum, and they're still, they'd still rather pay that penalty instead of getting health care. That's... That's a shame, isn't it? That people are, you know, something they depend on and they're gonna pay a $2,000 penalty and still not have health care. Not have health care for them, isn't it? It is, yeah, 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 yeah. Correct, a absolutely, absolutely. It depends on how you look at it. Yep. So it's 2.5% of household income yeah. or, or per child. But they're going to pop you with the higher of them. Yeah, so you would get it like you an individual. Okay. Say you're like 22 years old. Sure. And you have a nice job and you're going to pay an average of 2000 something per year as of paying 695 Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I... You're not sick. I mean, you're 22 years old. You can't be wrong. I, you can say it can't be wrong. That's right. But you have to look at it from both ends. I'd rather have insurance that I'm not sickly, but, you know, a 22-year-old be like, I pay that six ninety five. Uh, as $2, $2, $2, $2, $2. That, that, that's a great point, and that was the X factor. That's where they thought all the money was going to come from. These young people were just going to run out and buy health care. And, and the young people are saying, I, I mean, shoot, I remember when I was 24 years old, I was bulletproof, you know? I didn't need health care. Shoot. And I'm not going to spend a thousand bucks when I can pay a couple of hundred bucks for the penalty. So, no, I, I get it. And I think this is probably one of the biggest gaps in the affordable care. You know, when the politicians were running the numbers, they're like, hey, every person, all these young people are going to buy policies. They're going to buy policies, and they didn't. They don't even really believe in buying, um, <laughs> uh, they have second guess about um, life insurance. So I know sure. health insurance is going sure. because I've seen it, the, I mean, I've seen it down too many times, especially in my little area where I'm, I'm located from, everybody, you know, some people pass away or whatever, no insurance. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember when I was young that if, if I was in their shoes, it probably wouldn't be a priority to me either. So. Sure, sure, without a doubt, without a doubt. The subsidy back, paying it back. You got too big of a subsidy and you had to go back and explain and show and 
decided in November, so he didn't have time to Sure. But he had the money, so he put it into IRAs, and so it helped him some. He still had to pay back sure. a bit, but sure. it didn't help him much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the 2.5, let's go back. It's off your household, total total household income. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Adjusted gross, your AGI, that 2.5 comes off your AGI. So income. Then you've got adjustments. That'll create your adjusted gross income. That's the number that they pull off of for the 2.5%. Um, just grab me. We'll jump in. I, I can show you in the software. We'll look at a 1040 and just. So. Again, intended purpose of ACA was to expand health care coverage and then create a federal subsidy for the health care premiums for certain individuals that qualify. So the premium tax credit, it's a refundable credit. And again, it helps, we were just talking about it. It helps eligible individuals and families with low or moderate income afford insurance purchased through the health care marketplace. Now, again, to get the credit, there's a couple of requirements. Household income has to be between 100% and 400 of the applicable poverty level, or the taxpayer with a household income less than 100% of poverty level may still be eligible for credit if at the time they sought the coverage, the marketplace estimated their income would exceed 100% of the poverty level. Jason, don't you have a trivia question for him? Yes. Uh, so, so how many people uh, That's pretty dang good. <laughs> and how, how, how much was the total penalty that they paid? What was the aggregate amount? I'll give you a hint. It starts with a B. <laughs> a billion. Three, three, three. A B. A B. A B. A B. A B. A So it's over, over $3 billion. Yeah. Okay. Um, three billion. Penalties. People paid three billion dollars in penalties. My question is, where'd that money go? That's a bunch of. I know, but we still broke. It didn't go to the IRS and help them get phone lines, did it? <laughs> uh, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so let's, 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 complete, let's complete the math. So in 2016, how many people paid the penalty? So it went from 6.7 million to how many in 16? Oh, probably. It went higher. It went higher. It went higher. It went higher than 6.7 million. Okay. Wow. Anybody? Yes. Eight million. Uh, actually, 8.7. I'm surprised Now, the penalty actually went down. So, so can anybody guess the penalty for 7 to 8? The subsidies, uh, the subsidies are about twenty billion. And can anybody tell me the, the investment tax that's being calculated? Can anybody tell me what the investment tax was last year? What was paying on the investment tax? Point three point nine percent. It's about sixteen billion dollars. Hmm. I wonder what it wanted. I was that that that's a lot of revenue going into the government. Yeah. Well, the sad thing is, there's still a lot of people out there with health insurance. That's 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 that without. 
That's my whole point. If yeah. they make this type of money that we're, we're making it for people not having it, they need to make it a, the afford, affordable, the real affordable. Yes. The, the, the real affordable, not yeah. the fake affordable. The real affordable, yeah. Yeah. No, I. I, I, yeah. All right. So when an individual applies for assistance to help pay the premiums for the health care coverage through the marketplace, a couple of things need to go on. Number one, marketplace will estimate the amount of the premium tax. Again, estimate based on a couple of things. Family composition, projected household income, and then whether the parties are eligible for non-marketplace coverage. And as we were just talking about, those estimations, if you're off, holy cow, that's an that's a uncomfortable conversation talking to one of your, your taxpayers when they're having to pay back 4000 2000 I mean, whew. Yeah, I wouldn't want to have that conversation. So anyway. A, a point, number one, try to make sure if you're helping the customer with this, try to get it as close as possible. There's, there, but, you know, lay that foundation. Hey, there's a lot of moving pieces here. You know, there's a lot of moving pieces that can affect this and let them know what those moving pieces are. Because what you don't want is that person walking in and having an additional five or $7,000 of tax liability and they never saw it coming. So, and then, like in your situation, there's no way you knew that was coming. So, Nothing you well, can I mean, do. He got it in November, but it was too late to yeah. think about it for years. Yeah. Even if it changed. But you, you didn't see they're going to make an adjustment for people like real estate people and think that all of a sudden they had a big sale that happened. We had a big sale in December and there was no way to adjust. Yeah. Income yeah. December. Yeah. Some type of retro clause or anything? I haven't seen anything like that. Has anybody? Has anybody seen, like, if it's late in the year, the money comes in, you yeah. weren't expected it? Yeah. Yeah. No, I haven't. No, I haven't either. I was hoping maybe you Makes sense, but I haven't seen it. So, based on the estimate from the marketplace, the individual can, number one, have all, some, or none of the estimated credit paid in advance, which, how many of you all have had people get that advance? As high as premiums are, this is a huge piece of helping them with the, with the insurance. And again, reduces the amount that they pay out of pocket for the monthly premiums. Now, these payments are called advance payments or premium tax credits or an advance credit payment. If the individual does not get advance credit payments, where do they get it? Yep. Yep. Now, an individual is eligible for the premium tax credit if they meet all of the following. Number one, have household income that falls within a certain range. What's that look like? Household income is the modified AGI of the taxpayer, their spouse, and then each individual that they claim. Modified AGI includes certain items otherwise that are non-taxable, like an example, Social Security benefits. And then cannot be complained, claimed as a dependent by another person. Number three, they don't file married filing separately. Tax return, there's that married filing separate again. Poor married filing separate. They don't get anything, do they? Um, enroll in coverage through the health insurance marketplace. Number five, aren't able to get affordable coverage. Number six, not eligible for either government sponsored programs, Medicaid, Medicare. And then seven, pay the share of the premiums not covered by the advance credit amounts. <coughs> so 1095A, who gets them? Who sends them? I'm sure you, I'm, it is, it is, it is. So how many of you have had somebody come in, you've done the tax return and then they got a, a letter saying, hey, Where's that 1095A that was supposed to be on the tax return? They're not going to receive any money until you send in that information, making those changes. And I'm like, well, I'm asking that. It's, well, I'm asking that. It's, 
It's amazing how they have amnesia when they're in your office, but as soon as that letter from the IRS comes, they can tell you exactly what it is, probably exactly how much, and how quickly that gets on your desk when it's holding up that refund. So, okay, well, good. It didn't. It didn't just me. So that's that's good. That's good. That's good. Well, and I had a lot of trouble. Uh, I had a client who said she had it with the marketplace, but never got the 1095 days. Yeah, and I would call and I order it. And, and they and wouldn't send it. So, I so. Many times I had to call for this one individual. What did you do? Well, I finally asked her. I finally asked her. I said, Can you just read it to me off the oh, amount? Sure. Created my own. So you just created a 1095. Yep. Now, if she gets a letter though, so remember this, if she gets a letter from the IRS and you recreate it, they won't accept that. Yeah, they've yeah. got to have, they got to have the original. Well, they got to have the original. They, 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 they will send it to the client. Well, she she gave me all the information. Yeah, I, I guess, did it have the, would it be the ID number from the marketplace? Did she have that with it also? Oh, 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 this it wasn't the customer giving you all the information, it was the marketplace, okay. So why? why? It had been mailed twice and, and. I got you. And they just somewhere there was a, maybe some kind of mistake in the address. Right, sure. I got you. No, I got you, I got you. Right. So, so two scenarios there. We got the, the front end where the person, you know, they come in in, in mid-January and they want, they want that refund quick. They're not willing to wait on that 1095A, so they're telling you, hey, I, I, I just called. Yeah. Well, and, and, and then there's times when it, when it in, in your scenario where, you know, they do want to be on it. They, they said, hey, I've got it. I've got it, but the form never comes in. So you've got two extremes, one where they don't want to claim it on there, and then the other where they, 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 they do want to claim it on there, they just can't get the form. Yeah. So when they get the letter from the IRS about the 1095A, um, everybody I've talked to mails it in, but I've heard that on the form, that's, that, there we go. And you'll get it. Seven days. That's that is that is that is perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to hear because people have been telling me that that on the form there's a fax number. There's certain requirements on the cover sheet that you have to put on there, but the turnaround time is so much quicker. So, and and we had a lot of people. In fact, the majority of people were just mailing them in, and so several people said, "Hey, you fax them." It gets processed a lot quicker. Yeah. You haven't heard that they're going to do that they'll do scan instead of faxing them. I have not. I have not. Um, I, yes, exactly. 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 It's, it's always the tax preparer's fault, isn't it? Yeah, no, 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 no amended return, no amended return. Just plug it in and shoot it back in. What is it, second page of the 1040? And, but I think it was just second page, isn't it? That's all they require? Yeah. 1095A and then the 8962. Yep, exactly. So page two of the 1040, 8962, and then the 1095A, and then boom, you fax those back in, and you said within seven days, that's, for the IRS, that's not bad. <laughs> All right, so the information contained on the 1095 is used to reconcile the net premium tax credit. Again, that's reported on the tax return. A taxpayer who purchased insurance in the marketplace, again, should wait for that 1095A. We talked about that, though. That's a big should there. What's on this 1095 that's so important? Policy number, who's covered under there, the enrollment premiums, applicable second lowest silver plan, so the SLCSP, and then also the advance payment of the premium tax credit. 1095B, what's that? What's the 1095B? Employer, exactly. Does everybody get one of these? 
They're supposed to, right? All the employers are supposed to if you're employed. Has it been required, though, over the last couple of years? You know, the insurance comes out, or IRS comes out and says, it's going to be required this year, it's going to be required this year, and then it seems like right before tax season <laughs> kicks in, I guess they hear so much feedback from employers saying, hey, I'm not going to get this, and hey, it's going to delay refunds, or this, that, and the other. They usually end up um, receding on that a little bit and allowing or not requiring the 1095B. So the question was asked, is it required? As of right now, the IRS hadn't come out and said, hey, you don't have to include it, OK? So as of right now, let's say it needs to be included, but again, I think they'll make a, um, you know, they'll, they'll allow it without it. Now, it may also um, be combined with the 10, 1095C also. What's the 1095C? Insurance company. That's, that's the, so every employee of an employer that has 50 or more full-time employees that are eligible for insurance coverage, they get this 1095C. Even people who don't take the coverage but qualify for it should still get this C. What does it identify again? Employee, employer, months of eligibility for coverage, and then the cost of the least expensive monthly premium. No, no, I don't think it's a it's a limitation. I think every employer needs gets that to you if they're if you've got coverage through them. So, the, the, repeat the question for me, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I have three employees, right? So, at what point do I have to start? Can't give an insurance, like, Okay, so the question is, what number of employees do you have to have in order to be mandated to give insurance? I believe it's the 50 or more. 50 or more. Correct. Correct. That's a good question. I think a few of them are in there already, but I don't think there's one any. Of the, one of them that I got had the backside or whatever, it had a, so that helped me a lot. And I just we, kept that for everybody. But... I, I, I think we keep adding more and more every year, but I don't, I, 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 I can't promise you we're going to have every single one of them. But that, that, that's a great point about the knowledge base being a resource for you. Um, again, there's so many moving pieces and this this thing is so big you know again every year we get a little bit better but we also find out there's a lot of stuff we don't have included in there so the form 8965 what is that that's that's what we use to yeah we, we we use that to report the coverage exemption granted by a marketplace or an exchange and to claim the coverage exemption you do that on the tax return right you calculate the share of responsibility payment for any month the taxpayer or another member of the tax household had neither health care coverage nor an exemption. 8962 used to account for any subsidy that the taxpayer received that was purchased through the marketplace or exchange. Again, those amounts are reported on the 1095A that we talked about earlier. And again, you put on the form 8962. Now, the amounts reported on the health insurance marketplace statement that ultimately are reported on the 8962, that's the net premium credit will be affected if the underlying health care policy was a shared policy. So what are some examples? The amounts reported on the health insurance marketplace statement or the 1095A it may need to be allocated between individuals on the policy. The shared policy allocation, what's that look like? 
So there's a couple ways. Either it's just an agreement between the policies or you just have to do the math if they can't agree. Allocation has to be reported to the IRS on each person on the policy's tax return. Again, the more policies, allocations, parties, parties. Gets complicated, doesn't it? Gets really complicated. What are usually the X factors that create the most problems? Divorce and custody issues. And I'm sure if you've been in this business long enough, you're, you're dealing with these issues. So we mentioned the knowledge base, what are resources for you, um, FAQs, and then again there's some sections on the 8962 and the 8965. Um, again, um, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces here and there are some situations in every class we figured out a situation where maybe the, the software hasn't calculated it all the way or there was a manual calculation or um, you know, there's pieces. Again, we're trying to evolve with the Affordable Care Act. With that being said, how many people are familiar with this from last year? Yes. Where you can say yes or no if you want to compute the responsibility payment. I mean, boom, you tag that no and it completely goes away. Com so last year, the IRS came out and said, in fact, it was really the middle of tax season, I think, when, when the IRS came out and said, hey, we're, we're basically going to give you, uh, somebody comes in and they said, I can't get my documents, I don't want to pay the payment, they have the option to do that. So obviously our first question back to the IRS was, okay, is this going to delay refunds? Is it going to hurt them on the marketplace if they go back to apply? You know, what are the ramifications? Well. They, they wouldn't tell us. There were, you know, they would give us no specific ramifications. So basically what we had to say is, hey, if you're answering no here, there could be ramifications. Again, delay an e-file. If you do a bank product, the bank may delay the, 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 the rebate check. The, personal information? Yep. Yeah. So under taxpayer's information, if it's joint, you have taxpayer spouse, and then it would be the last line item. It's right after that. It's, it's, it's right after that. Yep. And again, you know, this wasn't in a very conspicuous spot. You know, um, I think most preparers want to go through the process and do it, do it properly. This is kind of like a last ditch effort if, if, if somebody's not willing to. To, to process or pay the payment, and then they don't have the documentation to back it up. With that being said, the IRS has just recently come out and said, hey, this year we're not allowing that. If you do, if you submit it, uh, we're even here, it may possibly reject the return for the first time. So that's something new. In the past, you don't have the documentation, it still goes through. They get a nasty letter saying, hey, send this in, we don't have it. Now they're saying this could cause rejects. Again, not confirmed, subject to change, but I just want to make you aware of it that, hey, I'm going to do it like I did last year and I'm going to leave it off and shoot it in. Holy cow, I've never had something reject before for affordable care. So just, just be prepared if that pops up on the radar, okay? Well, this question may actually go away. So as per the IRS requirements, and then you're just going to be required to enter in the 1095A. So any of the, any of the documents that come with it, you'll have to do the 8962 or the 8965. So you'll have to fill out. Or if they're in the marketplace, if they're, they've got um, coverage but yet just aren't covered under um, market share, you know, you answer those questions, it automatically eliminates the penalty as is. Not a whole lot of changes to affordable care um, as far as in the software. Nathan mentioned this yesterday and again just wanted to bring it up to you, your attention. We're just edit household required annualized, annualized contribution amounts and covered affordability worksheet currently being used. That edit household required contributions, about, you had to enter those in manually. Now they'll calculate for you. So 
not a huge enhancement, it just eliminates you having to do some manual processing on your end. You entered it where? For 17, that's when the software comes out, it'll, that will be in the program for <laughs> I'll let y'all, I'll let y'all talk to Nathan about that. So, so. All right, I've been up here running my mouth a lot. What, what, what questions do we have about affordable care? Any unique situations that you've been dealing with? Oh goodness, so, so the question is, hey, I, I, I should qualify for an exemption. I apply at the marketplace. I've, I've heard people getting it very, very quickly, and then I've heard horror stories of people, you know, taking months and months and months. So I would advise them as quickly as possible. Yep, yep, and, and the way I'd frame that is that, hey, it could take the marketplace who knows how long. The quicker you can get that, the earlier I can file your taxes for you. And also, some people, you know, they said that they were going to make the estimated to make 15 grand next year, and so they pay that 60 and everything else, and then they get hit with, they have to pay back something, and I'm like, well, this is something changed, so no, it was be 15 grand, I didn't make more, and I still look at it from the previous year, and it was the cost of the system. A couple of things, and I've heard that before. Maybe the marketplace calculated it incorrectly one or something else changed okay was it a dependent it may not have been income income may have been close but did they lose a depend you know was there another x factor there that i mean unfortunately they received the money based off you're, you're robbing peter to pay paul so you're either going to receive it on the front end in the money or you're going to pay it on the back end it's it's one way or the other so it's not that they're being being shorted they just got it early so um now they're having to pay it back. So, and again, I'd always frame it as, hey, this is an estimate. This is subject to change. This, you know, we're looking at, you know, probably around this amount, but if you go over, under, lose a dependent, you know, like we were talking about earlier, that number could change considerably. And get income in December. Yes, yes, income in December. It's way to, off. Had, had to pay something back. Yeah. Every person. Yep. Whether it was three hundred dollars or three thousand. Sure. And I guess the thinking of the IRS is, hey, we don't want to give that interest-free loan out. So if we're going to err, we're going to err on the side of them having to pay it back. So. But still, you're basing it on your income before the year before. Usually. There's going to be some type of movement. Gonna always have an There's going to be some kind of movement there, or something's going to change. You know it. It, yeah, yeah, good point.